Hi, my name is Chris New, and I'm a Power Module Applications Engineer at Wolfspeed. In this video, we're going to explain how to simulate and analyze the performance of Wolfspeed Power Modules in LTSPICE using a double pulse test as a common method you'll likely want to perform for your own system. To get started, open your SPICE model download folder. Then, navigate to the Example Circuits folder and find the Half-Bridge folder. Next, open up the LTSPICE schematic file at the file name listed here. The DPT here stands for Double Pulse Test. Let's start by deleting the module outline in the schematic and replacing it with the CAB450 M12 XM3 power module model. Before we take our next step, let's talk a little about some of the basics of a double pulse test. A double pulse test is a basic circuit that can be used to determine the transient behavior of a silicon carbide MOSFET under specific conditions. It can be used to determine switching losses, slew rates, voltage overshoots, dead time requirements, and much more. To understand how it works, let's take a look at this example circuit in waveforms. Here, we have our gate source voltage across Q2, our drain source across Q2, and the drain current through Q2. The reason double pulse tests are used to extract these transient characteristics is because the device only needs to be switched four times and the total duration of the test is on the order of tens of microseconds. The sequence of a double pulse test is as follows. First, we need to charge the bulk capacitor to our desired voltage across the module, from V plus to V minus. This represents a real system. Note that in the LT spice simulation, it uses an ideal voltage source here for simplicity. Next, we turn the low side device on for a specific duration. This duration is known as the charge pulse. During this time, current flows through the load inductor, then the low side switch, and back again to the capacitor bank. Throughout this time, the current will increase. The larger the load inductor, the slower the current will increase. Once our desired load current is reached, we turn off the low side device, and this is known as the turn off event. During this time, current will freewheel through both the load inductor and the high side diode. After a few microseconds, we simply turn on the low side device again. This is known as the turn on event, and it occurs at approximately the same voltage and current as the turn off event. Since the low side MOSFET is now conducting the inductor current, the high side body diode current will fall to zero. The non-idealities of the diode will cause what is called a reverse recovery event. Finally, after a few more microseconds, we turn off the low side device one last time and conclude the test. We can then analyze the turn off and turn on waveforms to see how the device behaved under these conditions. With this information in hand, let's take a look at what simulation parameters we can adjust in our double pulse test. The first is our bus voltage, or VBUS. This parameter will set the operating voltage of the device. Second, we can edit the load inductor, L, and the charge pulse, charge pulse time, to set the load current. Third, we can edit the gate drive parameters. This can be simple, such as setting the external gate resistor, but we can also set rise time, separate turn off and turn on resistances, the internal gate drive resistance, and parasitic inductance as well. The temperature can also be set with the global LT spice temperature by editing the dot temp parameter. To wrap it all up, any other parasitics can also be added to the system, such as commutation loop inductance. Now that you know all that, let's run an actual double pulse test and analyze our waveforms. Plot the voltage V mid and the current IR low, which is the current running through the shunt resistor, and zoom in to the turn off event. We can see our current is right around 240 amps. Let's switch that to something a little more typical, such as 200 amps, by increasing the load inductance to 60 microhenries. While we're at it, let's change gate resistance to zero ohms. Now it's time to rerun the simulation and see what that did to our turn off transition. Great, that change updated us to 200 amps load current. Let's create a new plot plane and add the gate voltages and another plot plane to calculate power by multiplying the voltage and the current.
We can now use the cursors to analyze some key characteristics. For example, we can see that our voltage peaks at approximately 930 volts, and that our rise time is around 32 nanoseconds. There are multiple ways to calculate switching losses in LT-SPICE. Our preferred method is to integrate using a behavioral voltage source. Start by adding a behavior voltage source component to your schematic. Next, add a ground to the minus node and a label to the positive node. Then enter the function V equals IDT of your midpoint voltage times your load current. Rerun the simulation and plot the voltage of the behavioral source and you will be able to see the switching energy. The units are in volts, but we can change it to joules with a unit conversion. We can then use the cursors to look at the difference in energy before and after the switching event. Here, we see a turn off switching energy of approximately 3.7 millijoules, or MJ. Let's do the same for our turn on event. Here, the energy is around 6.7 millijoules, and our overall total energy is 10.4 millijoules. If we compare these numbers to our datasheet, we can see that the results are really close. But it's important to remember that this simulation will never match the datasheet exactly. Instead, this exercise is useful for making approximations and studying trends. For example, we can look at the effect of increasing gate resistance by using a dot step command. Right click the param rg statement and edit to step param rg list 013510. This will run the simulation of gate resistors or RG at 0, 1, 3, 5, and 10 ohms. As anticipated, the device slows down due to the higher RG, which results in increased switching losses. That concludes the basics of a double pulse test operation. Now, let's take a quick peek at some of the more advanced features of the SPICE model. First off, we'd like you to notice the temperature nodes on the right. The junction temperature reports are utilized for precisely that, measuring the junction temperature. By default, the temperature starts at the dot temp temperature value. By using the power losses and a Cower model of the module's transient thermal impedance, or ZTH, we can quickly pinpoint the die temperature. Let's look at TJQ2 and see how temperatures rise during the turnoff event. Here, volts equate to degrees Celsius. With a higher RG, the temperature of the junction is higher as well. You will also note that there are ports for the MOSFETs, labeled Q, and the diodes labeled D. Please be aware that the diode junction temperature ports are only active for modules that come complete with embedded Schocke diodes. The base plate temperature is determined by the case temperature, or TC, ports. These ports can be connected to a resistance and voltage source in order to simulate the use of a coolant. To modify the thermal behavior, simply right-click on the module symbol and edit the thermals value. On the spice line, if you set the thermals to zero, your temperature will be constant throughout the simulation. Okay, let's go ahead and make that change and rerun the simulation. As we can see, the temperature is indeed constant at 25 degrees Celsius throughout the simulation. This consistency is a major advantage of using Wolfspeed power modules models. Plus, there are plenty of other features that can be quickly evaluated using LTSPICE. We hope you found this quick tutorial to be both informative and useful. Feel free to visit wolfspeed.com to download model files, read our SPICE model user guide, and watch additional tutorial videos on simulating with Wolfspeed silicon carbide.